Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. This was going on and we had no idea. Our tools and technologies help innovators deploy their creativity. It's a love project, but it's really an investment in people. Today on Spotlight, exploring spiritual healing through art, how common materials create conversation. Plus, science companies are developing new kinds of plants that help the earth. And then a man with the largest collection of a certain type of antique car that you've probably never heard of. But first, a book recounts the long-term effects of radiological exposure in Coldwater Creek. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. America's post-World War II years were a time of optimism and hope. Veterans returning from the war settled in peaceful new suburbs to raise families. Professor Linda Maurice grew up in such a suburb north of St. Louis. Behind her family's home was an inviting and idyllic creek. People living along Coldwater Creek didn't know that it was contaminated with nuclear waste from the production of the atomic bomb. Before World War II, during the top secret Manhattan Project, St. Louis's Mallinckrodt Chemical Company processed uranium. The waste was stored at a site near the St. Louis airport. The radioactive waste leaked into the groundwater and contaminated the area, including the creek. A flood in 1957 spread the contamination far and wide. In her book, Nuked, Echoes of the Hiroshima Bomb in St. Louis, Maurice details the history of the radioactive contamination that has affected so many in North St. Louis County, including her own family. When I was nine, our family moved to Florissant and uh, lived about a thousand feet from a major tributary in, of Coldwater Creek. We never in a million years would have suspected that anything, that this contamination existed or, or uh, that we were in any way vulnerable. Over time, it was in our neighborhood that people noticed a, um, an unusual number of cancers, the 20-year graduating class of McClure North High School. Facebook played a role in the Coldwater Creek Facts Group with their high school reunion for the first time because north of 270 hadn't been tested, rem remediated, or anything. That's how they discovered there was a real problem because people had moved all over the place, but they came together on Facebook to find out about the reunion. Hmm. And, and, and there were some cancers that, like, uh, the cancer of the appendix is extremely rare but it wasn't rare in this neighborhood. Was it hard emotionally at all to write it because of the family connection? At first, when I found out about the government report, I was stunned. It took me a few days to get my head around the fact that we were living in this place that was home, and the whole time this was going on and we had no idea of it. There's a picture of our family, our family of five, shortly after we moved in and, you know, and we it stood in front of the house, all five of us, and smiling. I always liked that picture, and I haven't been able to look at it since that discovery. Now, eventually I will, you know, but this is a way of, in my own mind, uh, I, I know that you can't attribute a single cancer death to a single cause. There is this health problem that people needed to know about. Uh, we need to pay attention to waste, you know, and we need to realize that uh, radionuclides don't go away. They're not washed away. Anyway, uh, that's kind of where I am with it. The cleanup of the creek is not expected to be completed until 2038, which if you think about it, is almost a century after the contamination first yeah. started. 
To find out if anyone's ever been held responsible for the contamination, watch the full interview at HECmedia.org. With every stroke of the bow, every stroke of the brush, with every stroke of genius, the arts make life in St. Louis richer, not just emotionally, but also economically. In our region, the arts create almost $600 million a year in economic activity, supporting more than 19,000 jobs, generating almost $60 million for state and local governments, with almost 12 million annual arts-related visits. That's more than all St. Louis sporting events combined. Whether in a park, on a street, or a wall, experimental or a classic, the arts deserve our support because the arts help support us. HEC Media is proud to be our region's home for arts, education, and culture. Because in St. Louis, the arts mean business. We are here at the St. Louis Artist Guild for our new exhibition series, diving into the idea of spiritual healing through practice of art. That could be diving into materiality and what that means to somebody. It could dive into the idea of being in a specific place and that feeling that that place gives off or working through your own personal issues within your art. You will first see Still Point by Christina Lewski in our Ramp Gallery, which is a series of vignettes along the Mississippi River that are outside her studio, giving off the feeling of isolation. There's also this excitement about the colors that she's using, so you might feel warmth or feel like you're standing right on the other side of the bushes looking through that window to see that scene that she's painting. As you enter into our main gallery, you will see a solo show by Ronald Young, Everything Falls Apart. When people come and see this exhibition, um, my main objective is to present them with a body of work that asks questions. I'm not here to provide any answers. Uh, I have my own interpretation of what I feel the materials represent. These pieces are a body of work that I've been creating since the COVID epidemic has subsided and it gave me a chance to kind of like answer some questions that I wanted to deal with, namely, what is it that our society is dealing with today? And uh, these pieces kind of reflect that, uh, my attitudes towards many of the things that we see going on right now, many of our institutions that we thought would stand forever, we're seeing are being tested. We have political strife, we have economic strife around the world, and this is just my reflection of that. The burnt wood, the nails, the ropes and chains are all metaphors for all of the many things that I see that are going on in our society right now and how we are able to deal with them and that these materials have been around for a long time and that just like these materials, we will find a way to deal with the problems that we have in our society today. But I want people to look at these materials and get their own impressions from them. Many of them are things that are common everyday materials, but they are presented in such a way that it creates a, a, a conversation of how do we get here and how do we proceed forward uh, from this point in time. Lastly on display is Beyond Belief, a national juried exhibition juried by David Brinker, who is the director of the Contemporary Museum of Art at St. Louis University. Beyond Belief explores the idea of artists dealing with ideas that could potentially be healing or diving down the spiritual avenue of art or the idea that you could be personally working through this idea of enlightenment through your own work. So on display you will see sculptures, you'll see paintings, drawings, fiber work, there's even a sculpture done with Legos. Every artist is taking a different approach that are all giving this idea of materiality having some kind of meaning. So dealing with all of these avenues bring in the idea of healing through art's sake. Part of the St. Louis Artist Guild's mission is to provide inspiring experiences to visitors to our gallery but also to the community. All the exhibitions in our space allow artists from the community or even community people who are just interested in art to come in and be inspired to think about new concepts, inspired about art making, inspired about new ways of thinking about how a concept can be conveyed. And by doing all of that, we're providing this lovely opportunity to see national and local artists here in the St. Louis community. You can view these exhibitions on display until May 13th. You can find more information on our website at www.stlouisartistguild.org. 
teaching students STEAM in North County, later on Spotlight. Plant science has its challenges for startup companies developing new ideas and technologies. Sometimes it takes specialized laboratory equipment, greenhouses, and expertise. What we have launched is a plant pipeline as a service. We help innovators solve big global problems. Microbiologist Mary Fernandez is co-founder and president of Solus AgroSciences. Fernandez is a veteran in the ag tech world who took the lead developing the novel idea to support agriculture companies globally. They can rely on a company like Solus to do all of their discovery and development if needed. And Solus is playing a key contributing role in the St. Louis ag space, providing startup companies the research and development they need to succeed. It's like giving them big agricultural company capabilities, even though they're a small startup. What we really do is provide a one-stop shop for all of their research and development. So we can design plants, the new varieties of plants, we can develop plants and characterize those plants and provide the output as a product to these innovators. Solus AgroSciences is on the front line of a global issue. Which is solving global food challenges. So a lot of these innovators are trying to produce new varieties of plants or learn from plants. How can they be more climate resilient? How can they be more drought tolerant? How can they be more disease resistant? Solus is helping ag tech startups with a range of products. High protein soy. So soybean that has a higher protein content. You know, it could be a company that's trying to get medicinal products from plants. One local client is Edison AgroSciences, which is producing natural rubber from sunflower plants. Another company that's local is Aferna Bio, a company that's looking to increase yield in plants. We have created some of those plant varieties for them. With the support of Solus co-founders and BioGenerator, the investment arm of BioSTL, Fernandez helped position this one-of-a-kind company for tremendous growth and success. And her passion, making this dream a reality, could have far-reaching benefits. All of the companies that we're helping, we hope will solve problems, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's access to medicines from plants or fuel from plants or fiber from plants. Our tools and technologies help innovators sort of deploy their creativity, then we're successful. This story brought to you by Educate.Today. As dawn breaks over a field in Shannon County, Missouri, Wildlife photography instructor Sandy Brooks and her students are quietly waiting for their subjects to appear. Their patience is rewarded as a herd of wild horses emerges from the mist. Here they come, here they come. And there's a colt, the little black one is a colt. Sandy moves calmly from student to student, being respectful of the herd's sensitive nature while ensuring that no one misses the chance to capture a memorable image. We're trying to reintegrate the arts the way the old masters did. Da Vinci designed helicopters, but he also was a pretty good artist on the side. The two things were necessary to progress the information because we don't live a life where there's a file box for chemistry and a file box for physics and a file box for nature and a file box for art. We live a world where all those things happen to come together. By offering six to eight week courses in a variety of disciplines, as well as special workshops, the Academy seeks to accommodate a wide range of ages and skill levels, all while maintaining its commitment to the coexistence of art and science. Some of the most immersive experiences the Academy offers are those of wildlife and nature photography. Whether it's capturing images at the Wolf Sanctuary or photographing wild horses in southwest Missouri, students are taught not only how to take a great photo, but also to understand more about their subject from a scientific point of view. It's fascinating to see these animals in a wild environment. You're able to observe their behaviors and see them up close. and. Um, that's a unique experience that I don't think you're going to find very many other places. Get the kids out of the classroom and focused on nature using that cell phone camera as part of May's celebration of National Photography Month. Find photography videos and activity ideas at educate.today. Explore our region with Missouri Life.
In Boonville, Missouri, you will find a testament to early American automobile engineering at the Mitchell Antique Motor Car Museum. My family actually made the Mitchell products, which includes a Mitchell wagon. Then they started making bicycles, motorcycles, and um, of course the automobile. Mitchell is the name of my great-great-great-grandfather who made the first wagon <clears throat> in Fort Dearborn in uh, 1834, which now is downtown Chicago. Also, my great-great-grandfather is a Lewis, as myself, L-E-W-I-S, and he took over the wagon factory right after Henry Mitchell passed away in 1893. He is a gentleman that's responsible for uh, making the uh, bicycle, the motorcycle, and the automobile. In fact, we sold our first automobiles in 1903, the same year that Henry Ford's sold his first Ford. It was very successful until the end. After the family died out, a New York investment firm bought the plant and a product, and they didn't know how to run a, an automobile factory, so they finally sold a Nash, Nash Rambler, Nash Ajax cars. So it was a short but fun ride, and uh, we didn't have anyone in the family to take over after my great-great-grandfather passed away, so I wish I would have been born 150 years ago. We might still have Mitchell to go along with uh, General Motors, maybe Buick, Olds, Pontiac, and Mitchell, who knows. We have a Mitchell club, and uh, we have a roster. We send out flyers through car magazines and everything. And on our roster, we have probably maybe 160 Mitchells known to exist in the world. So they're really rare, really rare, hard to find, highly collectible. I have the largest collection in the world. I have 14 cars, three Mitchell wagons, the only Mitchell bicycle known to exist, and I have a 1902 Mitchell motorcycle that still runs, and I found that one in the Netherlands, in, in Holland. It's a great find, it makes my collection complete. And I, I truly, they're hard to drive, they're fun to drive, you gotta be able to really multitask, you've gotta be able to do a lot of things at once that we do not have to do in today's automobiles. Well, you have a spark retard in advance, you have not a gas pedal on these old ones, but you have a throttle lever. So if you want to speed up, slow down, you have to have one hand to slow down and speed up. Then you have to gear shift. You have to double clutch. Then, of course, there's not turn signals. Urban areas, you would have to use your hand signals, right turn, left turn, stop. So if you're trying to do all this at once, let's say we're going down a road in town, there's a stoplight ahead and it turns green, and I'm in high gear, I've got a double clutch and get into second gear. I've got to also slow down the, the speed of the car with the gas. I have to give a hand signal if I'm in urban areas. And you've just, and plus steer the thing and get turned around the corner. And we don't have power steering. The gas tanks were under the seat, the driver's seat, or if it's a big touring car, maybe in a dash, but it was gravity feed because they didn't have fuel pumps in those days. So can you envision uh, you fill your car up, don't get the lid on tight on the gas tank, put the seat cushion back on, you're driving down the road, gas is slushing out, and you drop your cigarette. Interesting. They're fun to drive, but then you pay for that because then you have to clean them up and work on them. All old cars leaked oil really bad in the old days. In fact, people didn't go to a garage to get an oil change like we do today because they were adding oil every, all the time while they're driving it, so the oil in the engine was always clean. And I give good tours, fun tours, and I, I enjoy sharing, so um, come to Boonville and see my tour, see my collection. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. My name is Amy Cook. I do mixed media shadow boxes. They're made mostly of paper, but there's also fabric and clay, uh, sticks, just a little bit of everything. My mom was a very good fabric artist. I always woke up to the sound of a sewing machine. So I had a doll house in her studio area and I used all the scraps of everything I could find of making everything out of every type of material. So then my journey started more many years later when I fell in love with paper. I was doing the paper flowers, making it all the upcycled, recycled. I loved all the maps and books and then 
fell in love with putting pieces together on a canvas, but then I felt like it didn't really tell the story enough. I thought of uh, the stages that were at the Muni when I worked there and how you're transformed with just the one stage can become so many different places and a different time era. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool if I put them in like a shadow box, they almost become like their own little stage. And that's when it really came together for me. My pieces are inspired by a lot of my favorite things. I take like a simple thing or a favorite childhood memory, like sailing, and then thought, well, what would make it even more fun is to have a bunch of dogs in it. And then you think about that feeling that you get when you're sailing and you feel like you're flying, so I need a boat that flies. And what would make it fly? Your creative mind is just always going, and let's put balloons, and it can't be a dog that's flying. It needs a goose in the front, because a goose can fly. So it's an idea that just keeps going and going and going. Make it more magical. When people walk into the booth, I feel like it's, the message is so easily received because people start to laugh and giggle. Uh, some people even tear up. They're just so magical and whimsical and inspirational. I, I love seeing that joy of expression on their face. Hey, this is Sarah Kiros. I'm with Kiros Customs. I make sterling silver jewelry with all natural stones. So everything I make is hand built. I draw all the designs myself, create all the small elements, piece them together, and then hand saw out my pieces. I file everything, solder everything by hand, and I try to create everything one of a kind and original so it's heirloom quality for people to love for a lifetime. My aesthetic and my jewelry is a little bit rustic but like a modern antique aesthetic. I try to do simple things once in a while. It just doesn't work out. I just add more and more details, which is fine. There's lots of flowers and leaves or feathers, just very organic pieces. I really get inspired by like asymmetrical shaped stones. They kind of help push the creativity. I just let the stones tell me what they want around them. One of my favorite things is when I hear gasp and oohs and ahs when people come to my booth. I love creating work that makes people feel so incredibly special and they get compliments when they wear it. So that just adds to the special element of it. My jewelry can be special occasion jewelry, but it doesn't have to be. I don't really want it to be. I want every day to be a special occasion when you wear your jewelry that I made. So what I love about Lawmire Art Fair in juried art fairs is that you get such a wide variety of folks that are coming out. You get, you know, people who go to strictly art fairs, you get people that just want a fun day out with the family, you get such a good variety of folks, and you get so many new eyes on your work that you never would have gotten before. I love having people come up and ask questions about my work, what types of stones, and the process it took for me to create these things. So I can't wait to see you at Lawmire Art Fair this year. I can't wait to show you all the new pieces I'll be making before then. And I want you to dive on in and try it on. Come find me at Kiro's Customs. Meet these artists at the 36th Annual Lawmire Art Fair, Mother's Day weekend, May 12th through the 14th. HEC Films, explore, inspire, educate, and entertain. HEC Films, just one of the many facets of award-winning content you'll find at hecmedia.org. All right, come on, girls. Get the phone next to mommy. She wants to show you. I need to show you something. Williams Academy is a school here in North County where we really want to educate young people on not just arithmetic or uh, literature, but on the world. So our goal is to make every student well-rounded in their opportunity in life. They go from birth up to four years old in our day school and uh, daycare, and then five years to 13 years old in our, in our after school program. A bear. Yeah. All right, give me some. Since he's been here, it's been different vocabulary he's picked up. Not to mention he's big in the science area, which I noticed that they did work big in the STEM area, which is 
perfect for me because when we get home, that's the first thing. Mom, can we do a volcano? Mom, can we do this? We did this at school today. And so since he's been here, it seems like it has made him bigger. Imagination in science has gotten bigger. So science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And somewhere in there, you have to understand that the entire world is made up of these five components. Music trains the mindset to be in different places at different times. And so when you hear something often, right, and it's repetitive, that might be how you remember how to count. It might be how you remember how to spell. Uh, so definitely music plays a major part in how we feel every day, but also in how we think about certain topics as we go forward. My mother is an educator but also an entrepreneur. And she owned a school for several years with us growing up, David and I. Uh, David is my business partner and the majority shareholder of Williams Academy. And she taught us through her teachings about Montessori, how to be active participants in the community. And so we basically stole, if you will, her, her swag, her energy, and created this this is different because it's male-led. When we think about education, a lot of times it's female-led, and I, I highly commend all of the female teachers that I've had in my recent past and in my past past who've taught me how to stand up and be a leader. However, uh, we're in a time period where uh, the male needs to show self-respect, but also how to lead not only as a family member, but how to lead as an educator and how to lead as a, a person in the society that we're growing up in now. Right, perfect. David and Yannick have the most wonderful demeanor on dealing with children, and it's really hard to find that at daycares. You know, a lot of people, you know, they get upset easy, or, you know, the way they react to things. They have a very even keel, you know, calm demeanor all the time, no matter what's going on. And I, it's a great example for the kids, it really is. The importance of this academy in this neighborhood goes beyond what we can see. There's an emotional uh, connectivity to the human life that really matters. And it starts right here at Williams Academy. Um, two years before we even opened the school, uh, no bank, traditional bank would give us a loan to start a business in this area. So it's, 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 a, it's a love project, but it's really an investment in the people. That's what this is all about. You know, a building with no person inside is nothing. It's the people that make this thing happen. Right, getting people to believe in your dream. That's what I do every day. I dream every night that these kids uh, do something better than what I could do. Next week, exploring Monet and Mitchell at the St. Louis Art Museum. Plus, reducing crash rates for teen drivers with ADHD. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.